As Brexit Day approaches, three million EU nationals living and working in Britain are keeping a close eye on developments. That's because the British government is proposing a new immigration policy once the UK leaves the bloc. And some critics are warning of a new Windrush scandal as EU nationals scramble to prove they have the right to stay. Now, no one knows what will happen after the UK leaves the EU, but there have been plenty of predictions. One of the Leave campaign's selling points to the public was the chance to reduce immigration numbers and give jobs back to the British. But could the new policies, in fact, damage the economy and Britain's reputation? The post-Brexit immigration blueprint is the biggest shake-up in border control in 40 years. We have been very clear to the three million EU nationals already here. We value hugely the contribution that you have made to this country. Deal or no deal, we want you to stay and we will protect your rights. But British Prime Minister Theresa May's long-time aim has been to reduce immigration numbers. And a UK think tank has warned changes could cost employers over a billion dollars, put off lucrative EU students and risk a repeat of the Windrush scandal. Last year, Caribbean nationals living in the UK for decades were either denied human rights or deported for a lack of documentation. How will the government's strategy harm economic prospects and can it ensure the rights of EU citizens won't be compromised? So a lot of things to discuss. Let me introduce today's guests at the round table. We have Kevin Craig, Labour Councillor for Lambeth Council in London. Maddie Timont-Jack, researcher at Institute for Government. Axel Antoni from the Three Million, a not-for-profit organisation formed after the referendum to support EU nationals. And Tony Devonish, Conservative member of the London Assembly. Good to have all of you at the round table today. Um, now, there are two separate issues to look at here. What happens to EU nationals? nationals um, living in uh, the UK after Brexit and what happens to immigration post-Brexit. So uh, Axel, let me start with you because the three million, um, the name refers to uh, the, the estimated number of EU nationals living in the UK. So uh, potentially they're going to be affected most. Yes, uh, we've been waiting for uh, almost a thousand days now for, for a solution of the problem we have is that uh, uh, our rights that we have here are going to be protected. Uh, we had some uh, words from the government, warm words from the government, saying they're going to guarantee our rights. Uh, have you not been reassured by that? Well, at the moment we are in a situation where we haven't got anything in law that actually guarantees our rights should we uh, leave uh, the uh, EU without a, without a deal. Uh, what's in law at the moment is, or what's going through the House of Parliament at the moment, is the removal of our rights through the immigration bill, uh, but we well, haven't. Your rights will be protected if you can prove that you have that is right. correct status. That is absolutely right. Uh, you have to apply for settled status. So what's happening actually through the immigration bill is the current law that is protecting our rights is going to be removed. That's the freedom of movement, ending freedom of movement. That includes the three million people here. Uh, and then people have to apply for the new status to actually secure their new status within, within the UK. So therefore, uh, if we leave without a deal, if we leave with a deal, the withdrawal agreement will take, part, uh, will, will take care of this. Without a withdrawal agreement, um, we will have a phase between the ending of freedom of movement, potentially the 29th of March, and successfully applying for the new status where people have uh, no status at uh, all. And if there's no withdrawal agreement, I mean, uh, a lot of things are up in the air. Uh, Kevin, what's, what's the problem with this? If EU nationals can't prove they've lived in the UK for years, some critics are saying we're going to have Windrush all over again. Uh, I don't think there's any problem with uh, asking folks to jump through certain administrative requirements and it remains the case that I, mean, I think there's a lot of us around this table who come from immigrant families and we know what immigration has brought to this country but we also know that 
concerns with British people about immigration was a factor in the Brexit vote. However, I would say that we just heard a British government minister there giving reassurances. And I say to Tony, why, did, why the first time did it take so long to give people assurances? And even now, do we have faith in a, in a prime minister to give people the right messages, which is that if you've got skills and if you want to make a better life for yourself and if you want to make a contribution, then this government will competently implement the processes to allow you to make that happen. I don't have confidence in the Prime Minister and her emotional intelligence to be able to do that. Maybe Tony does. Well, I absolutely do. I mean, the reality is this government is working to fulfil the referendum. That was a democratic result. And we want to reassure all citizens from anywhere in the world who are here, but particularly the EU citizens. You know, I have many in my West London constituency. I'd like to, if those that are listening and watching today, to please say, if you have problems specifically, casework is a fundamental part of being a local councillor, an assembly member or an MP. Please contact your councillor, assembly member or MP. But the I know there are always issues and this is one of the biggest changes affecting the UK yeah. in generations. We all accept that. But, but what the, we don't want is one or two people... The question is whether the getting it right because well, the course, government the, said it would working... learn from the Windrush scandal and then it came up of with course. a £65 fee which it's now asked. Yes. Yes. Um, the, the, the well, there seems to be a lot of confusion. No, no, they are listening. And Sajiv Javi, whatever you may be politically, whether you're media, whether you're Labour or whether you're an independent individual, Sajiv gets it. I believe the government gets it. The reality is, of course, there are issues when we have this fundamental change. But I'd like to repeat again, reassure any EU national watching. You, if you live in the UK now, you will live in the UK after the 29th of March. We want you in the country. Uh, the point was made earlier, it's about jobs as well. We want skilled workers in the UK, whether they've been here for a few months, a few years, or decades and generations. We have very large established communities. Many more have joined in recent years. You know, I have lots and lots of French friends, German friends, Italian friends, etc. Alberta Costa, who's in the news today, are one of our MPs, is a great personal friend of mine. You know, we don't want one or two people on each side of the argument, be it leave or remain, coming up with misinformation and scare right. stories and project fear. We want to reassure people. And the reality is, yes, there's always Why things you to ask be done. Well, let's talk about quid. project fear. Well, That's you know, the, you know, let, let, let's the, just let Maddie the, uh, the say The watchers something. don't really might care about the 65 point that's been resolved now yeah, you know well you know we can all say you know Labour governments haven't been perfect Conservative governments aren't perfect Agreed. the reality is it's about reassuring real people that are watching this show and they are safe in this country I Maddie. wanted I just wanted to come in I mean not necessarily I think on the sort of practical side of settled status, for example, and what you asked about Windrush I think that the government has committed to uh, to sort of even in no deal to ensuring that EU citizens can stay afterwards and they can register for settled status. But there is obviously, when any big project the government is embarking on, there are always going to be challenges. And I think one of the, the questions that's been raised by uh, different think tanks is around will everyone actually be able to register for settled status? They might be legally entitled to, but there are people, for example, there are nearly a, sort of a very high number of the EU citizens in this country are children, and yes. some of their parents might not realise that they yes. need to register for settled status. There are those who won't be able to... But surely um, they can prove they were... It's, born it's, in this I think I think they, that's true, but I, mean, I think the, it's the about how the government for was, that, It was yeah. back in the 1940s when they came, but here in 2019, the, the, surely it's easier to the, prove. The problem, the problem is about actually the, the 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 real problem is about a registration system versus an application system, and the application system that we have in place, which through settled status, is going to create a cliff edge in 2021, where people who have not successfully been processed through the settled status process, Why, either through uh, not knowing that they need to or uh, um, either because they can't actually access it in, in one form or another because they are, they, are, they are ill or either way, at the cliff edge, at the end of the cliff edge, these people at the moment will become illegal residents. Uh, where with, with Windrush, these people were given a right through law. Which means in, 1970, in the 1970s, when the Windrush generation was integrated, uh, the right was there. The only problem the Windrush generation had, they had no document to prove it. Right. Uh, whereas we, with a new settled status scheme that the, the government is currently implementing, we're actually creating a situation where if people don't apply, they will be illegal and therefore they will have no right 
to work. But as they will have Tony no... says, this is something that the, the, it's not a secret. Everyone knows what they have to I do. I mean, is one, thing, one, one, look, one, thing, one thing we can all agree is that Brexit has more debate than any other political subject. Absolutely. Probably in the last 30 years plus. I hear this from everybody. The reality is there's bound to be the odd person that hasn't heard about it, to use your point. You, well, there'll be lots of ways to resolve these what I'm really, really committed, and everybody in public life, in all parties committed, to make sure that people do not fall through the system. Absolutely. There will be one or two people, I'm sure. That's what councillors and assembly members and MPs and special interest groups like yours, we're all committed. But, but the reality is, there will always, let's not, let's get away from Project Fear on both no, sides. And let's Project actually, fear. let's not, not talk, fear. it, it well, is, let's, I mean, with this, respect. This, this idea of Project being, Fear is, is, is actually a, a serious fear. one that, that's, that's been talked about a lot. I mean, what, what, what do you think of, uh, I, I, about this? That right. and, and I think the bad sides are being um, exaggerated. I, I think uh, it's not about Project Fear. What I think it is about is how we talk about immigration as a country and then it feeds into how we deal with it practically. And I agree, I agree with so that. So how, how we talk about immigration and immigrants has been, and I'm not saying actually that Tony is part of this, but some of, of the more UKIP type of people, what do, what do immigrants bring to this country? How do we work? How do we function? Uh, can, how can you actually limit the people coming in? Does everybody know down the pub that a quarter of a million people from outside the EU were a net you know, inflow to this country in the last um, full year. That, that debate, and if, we, if we're honest about immigration and what we need as a country and the contribution, then you can move on to the systems and the, the hard detail that, to be honest, not a lot of people understand about how on earth can we make it work. And well, let, let's look at some of the nitty-gritty of the, 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 the white paper, because there is uh, one of the things which has been highly contentious is this idea of a £30,000 minimum salary requirement, Crazy. which is now uh, open to consultation. But um, uh, analysts saying that is going to have a huge knock-on effect on the kind of jobs that, that we're going to be able to fill. I'll That's why we've got a public consultation. You know, at the end of the day, these are all legitimate issues, and it's not for us to sit here and decide, you know, we are not the government around this table. But the government but, but the is government's running out of time. But I mean, no, it's well, got to come up with decisions but, you know, listen, soon. But in business, right, as, as well as a councillor, I founded a, a, a very successful business, uh, many staff, multi-million pound revenues, and business is terrified about this consultation proposal. It wants to see sector-specific recommendations for, for, for care, for example. It wants arrangements for students. And you're right, this is not the government sitting here, but you work closely with it. And when these consultation figures, they, they scare people. You know, and it, I'm, I'm just being honest well, about the I think, business view. I think there are, well, again, none of us talk for all businesses. I accept lots of businesses have worries, and I have those worries too. But the reality is this is part of a debate. But nobody is saying that we have come up with a final figure. It's a public consultation. It's one I really welcome, and I am hope and I'm sure the government will listen to what comes but back. And I'd urge all businesses to actually please come up actually with. respond to that consultation because I spend a lot of my re life responding to public consultations, whatever the subject be it an airport expansion or be it this, they are very important, so please respond. But whatever the, the minimum requirement's going to be, it's going to cost employers, right? It's going to cost them thousands per EU uh, um, national. At the moment, the costs are, are looking to be over a billion pounds over a, a five-year period. I mean, uh, how worried are businesses about well, the impact Well, I think the just, just what I would say, um, just talking about the white paper, this is something that the Institute for Government is going to be publishing a report on shortly, is how the government needs to manage migration or at least have the, mm. the tools in place to manage migration um, going forward after we leave the EU. And what I think we've seen from the white paper, particularly the 18-month delay in publication, is that the government at the moment just doesn't seem to have the tools to manage some of these trade-offs. So, you know, previously we could rely on the fact there's freedom of movement. So if there is increased demand in labour, in this labour market, then we could rely on EU migrants to fill that. Whereas once you don't have freedom of movement, there needs to be a serious conversation within government and also talking to external people, you know, other businesses, about what exactly we're trying to do with our migration system. Because, you know, normally, the traditionally at the Home Office, for example, the government department which manages it, it has quite a control mentality because they haven't needed to necessarily think through some of the economic 
sort of elements of migration. And I think that's what we've seen with the white paper is that it is a step, you know, it's, it is more detailed than a lot of the other Brexit white papers we've seen. There clearly has been a lot of conversation and they have, you know, they commissioned external evidence for, from mm. the Migration Advisory Committee, for example. But but I think there still is a, slight, there there's a bigger question about what are we trying to do with our exactly. migration system and, and, that and hasn't there seems been answered. to be a disconnect between what's seen as low earning and what's mm -hmm. seen as low that's skill. I think, I, mean. I think one of the main problems uh, about these, this idea is, is the premise and the promise of the uh, of of the new immigration system, that is going to be a fairer system. I mean, this is repeated over and over again. And in reality, what's happening is actually uh, we are ending freedom of movement as it's current. But really, freedom of movement doesn't end. It's just becoming freedom of movement for the wealthier. Uh, this is what's going to happen with the with the salary threshold. The other thing is we're not reducing hurdles for people to come into the country from outside the EU. We're just increasing hurdles for people to come from the EU to the UK. So there might so be more this, this whole, this from whole, outside the EU. Well, no, it, we, we're not, it's not a fairer system. That's the problem. It's not a fairer system. Who defines it, fairness? Well, that's... Uh, Sajid Javis stands up and says it's a fairer system that's actually skill-based rather than the country people come from, but it's not a fairer system, it's so. just increasing hurdles for one group but not decreasing hurdles for other groups. And if you look at something like the NHS, which we were all told was going to benefit after uh, Brexit with much more money, um, uh, starting salaries for nurses and midwives 23,000, junior doctors 27,000, healthcare assistants 17,000. Uh, I mean the predictions are that the NHS is going to be left with all these massive you could of, make of, of jobs that they can't There's, uh, they always, can't there's always predictions. At the end of the day, I'm more of an optimist than perhaps some of the commentators that have been but out But aren't there. we supposed to base policy on the most well, likely outcome? Of course, but I, I don't believe a lot of the very loud voices are actually voices that are very representative. At the end of the day, Sajib Javid is a man, you know his backstory, I won't bore viewers on that, but he's a man who cares passionately about these issues. He is working very hard to resolve them with people around the table and others. And that's what we're here to do. You know, I am optimistic about the future. There is also a flip side you have to remember with the greatest respect. I've been at an event this morning in terms of apprenticeships in London. There's still high pockets of unemployment in some communities across this country. Yes. We need to get those people back to work. And we all know whether you were leave or remain, some of the people that voted leave from those communities. We've got to get these people back to work. So and could this be so the impetus for that? I mean, it must be the same for among your constituents. Yeah, I mean, there, there is um, high uh, unemployment and pockets of deprivation even in affluent cities, you know, quite shockingly so. And I think there's consensus across the parties about the need to get people back into work and that agenda. But um, I, I don't th see any coherence um, between what someone like Sajid Javid says at the dispatch box and the fact that then a stat comes out where vital people in the NHS are automatically at the moment deemed as they wouldn't have the same con conditions and ability to remain in this country. But there is a transitional period, isn't there, where people will be able to come to the UK, uh, I think, for a year without a, a, a visa to but try and would, smooth who would, over? Who, who, would, who would pack feel? their bags and who? come to the UK yeah. for a year to then be chucked out again and not so being allowed hard. back into the country yeah. for another 12 months to work. Yeah. Um, so th this, this is the question. I came here 21 years ago. I would have not qualified under the £30,000 hurdle because I came from university. My starting salary was way below, even if you take inflation into case, yeah, um, even if you take that into, into, I would have not qualified for the £30,000. I'm running a business nowadays. So that's, that's reality. I have not taken a job of somebody. The, the, the idea that Restricting the job market by reducing immigration will suddenly move people into work mm. uh, is, is wrong. That's seeing people as a commodity. That's saying people can do anything and everything. Um, and that's not what, what actually that's not that's not what the Home Secretary is no, that's not what the Home Secretary is actually saying. He's saying yes. he wants the right skills in. Yes. So but you also made the point of unemployed people having the opportunity to go it back into the job market through res restricting immigration. So you can't have both. You can either have a skills-based immigration system or you can say reducing immigration will open up more opportunities for, 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 for young unemployed people, which I think is actually an issue of other government policy like education, like uh, opportunities, like in, in other parts of the country, we talk in London. Well, I mean, it's uh, trying to increase the, the, the skill base of yeah. uh, a UK population, which presumably goes hand in hand with, with trying to reduce immigration. 
I don't think it's uh, an either and argument. I mean, I, some people on the extremes of the Leave camp may say that, but I really believe that you can do both. You know, the reality is we are, this is a global city, one of the two genuine global cities, New York and London. People do want to come here, but we do have pockets of long-term unemployment. Even but, my but three northern parts of my three central London boroughs, the wealthiest boroughs in London, we have real issues with certain communities. And if we can open up job opportunities... those are not the communities who are going to yes. fill the job gaps in schools and hospitals, are they? I, not without I, some substantial... I think, I think we're talking about some very low-paid jobs which they may open up. You know, it's not an argument that I personally fully support, but it's, it's an argument that well, has to be made. What you know, about and, and junior doctors and, and, and healthcare assistants and people working with skills in, in yeah. social welfare? Well, again, there's a consultation. low skill Hopefully jobs. the consultation, hopefully this will come through in the consultation. You know, so the do, you, do you think that 30,000 salary... Well, it's not, you know, I'm not going to, gonna, I'm not going to sit but here. Do you think and, it should be reduced? No, What's your not, view? It's, no, it's not. It's not for me to comment on government policy. Why not? You're, you're he part doesn't of agree. He doesn't. He, he basically, with respect, he doesn't it's agree with it, and he knows he's a, re will, he's a reasonable man. Will, he knows that we should listen will, to independent experts about the structures to try and get this right. He's a reasonable guy. We will have a debate. Thank you for talking for me. Well, you be, you know, the reality is, we have to be reasonable to say that that salary requirement is high and should be reduced. You, that is a view that lots of people say to me and lots of people say the reverse. Do businesses share this confidence that it will be resolved? Well, I think that the, the, I mean, the only thing I would comment is, I mean, I agree it's positive that at least this 30,000 um, sort of salary threshold is out for consultation and I do think the business should, should be engaging because with that, that Because that is the is same really minimum requirement for outside the EU as well. It's, yeah, it, that so, is already so I think, uh, and, in existence. And that's the thing, is I think there, there have been some positive moves within the white paper, but I think that it is really important that you know, external people engage with it and actually say this is what we need, this is the reality of our experience because that's one of the problems that we've identified in previous policy decisions in the Home Office is that there hasn't been really enough evidence when they've been making policy decisions and some of that evidence comes from external engagement and drawing on external expertise. So I do think that's a really important step that... But the businesses do engage with that but of course it's really important that the Home Office and the Home Secretary take that on board and I think that's what we we'll have to wait and see what people actually say in the consultation and what they then do with it. Do, do you think the government is being transparent about its, what, its end goal in terms of reducing its net immigration figures? Well, I, I think the government's been in trouble on that ever since it was first articulated by I think David Cameron originally mm. um, and they found that it's to be fair to them, they've got this quandary where they know that the British people, in the most general sense, were worried about immigration, right? Not in a racist sense, but, the, you know, there was public services perceptions, that they were worried about immigration, and there was no narrative coming about how we could address immigration in a fair way. So this attempt to put numbers on it, I, I think, is very, very difficult. Um, for them because mm. you've got a quarter of a million people, as colleagues have said, coming in from outside the EU in the last full year. Um, and I think the, uh, the, the how to get it fair is just very, very challenging. But I think the starting point is what works well elsewhere and just when we talk about immigration, you know, can we do it in a way that recognises this country is built off the backs of immigrants? But this figure that's been banded around of... Uh, less than a hundred thousand and Theresa May did say biggest yeah it's in the, in the tens of thousands. It I mean, was the biggest mistake made because it was never achievable. Uh, a with freedom of movement it was never achievable yeah. but even right. even excluding freedom of movement from the EU uh, we always been more higher on the outside uh, uh, immigration from outside the EU than a hundred thousand so what it actually created was a perception within the public and this is where this whole, the whole problem started that there is no control over immigration. If you set a target that you will never achieve, you will always fail to achieve it. And the public will look at it and say, you're failing, you're failing, we need more controls. So this target was the biggest mistake and I think one of the biggest drivers why we are in a situation where we are right now talking about immigration. And let's be, let's be clear, clear here, the government didn't have any information on immigration from the EU until the MEC report came out uh, last October uh, there was no study done before the referendum, so they, we were talking in a void of information, and that void was filled by people who said, we have an unsustainable level of, of immigration, which politi politicians still use, we need to return to sustainable levels. The Immigration Advisory Committee report has not stated that we've got an unsustainable level of immigration at the moment. 
So pe politicians going out and still using we need to return to sustainable levels of immigration are misleading the, 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 uh, the, the also an argument on what is a, a sustainable level. Um, to, I mean, do you, Tony, uh, it's, it's, it's clear, and you're obviously aware of this, that, that a lot of um, EU nationals uh, feel that, you know, that they've been um, abandoned by the government on this and, all, and the debate about immigration is, is far from clear. Do you, do you think the government is, uh, you know, going down the right path to, to put people's minds at rest? Yes, I do. And the, the reality is we all know that wherever you are, I mean, I remember going and knocking on doors in a home county seat and immigration is an issue there, you know, really passionately felt. Now, I may not agree with what was said to me very bluntly on the doorstep. London view that was articulated very strongly by my, my colleague here is not a view that when you get outside of London and the big cities is heard. We've got to represent all people and listen to all points of view. We may not agree with them all, but we are moving in a consensus. We have to do so. Remember, the last Labour government did lie. Jack Straw, the Blair minister, admitted they lied very strongly about the numbers that were coming in at the time. And politicians aren't trusted on many, many topics at the moment. The public, whatever, whatever I think, whatever you think, do not trust us on immigration. Can I just reassure people that if they have any particular issues on a particular case, do contact your yes. councillor, assembly Absolutely. member or MP, because at the end of the day, we all want the EU yes. nationals to remain in this country. And please don't listen to what some in the media do scare on these yeah. stories. Uh, I completely agree uh, with absolutely. that. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. Um, that was a, a really interesting debate and clearly a lot of issues still to be resolved. Thanks for joining us here on Roundtable. And if you have any comments to make about today's show, we're on Twitter at TRT World, hashtag Roundtable. Until next time, bye for now.